I really don't care about cars. They take me from point A to point B. Now, this hasn't stopped me from enjoying a racing game here and there in the past. I actually used to rent stuff like Top Gear Rally back in the 90s, but pretty much all I can bring myself to care about anymore is Mario Kart and F-Zero. But about a year ago, I was in the arcade room at MAGFest in Washington, D.C., and a buddy and I played a bit of Cruisin' Exotica. This really brought back a rush of nostalgia for Cruisin' USA. Not from the arcade, but the N64 version, which a good friend of mine bought during the game drought that followed the system's release in 1996. This is a game that I always accepted as being kind of bad, but we enjoyed playing it anyhow. I knew it would be a stupid decision, but I actually came close to buying a copy for myself way back when. But nowadays, when N64 racing games are worth about five bucks, it seems pretty harmless to give in to the guilty pleasure. So over the past year, not only have I revisited Cruisin' USA, but I've also checked out the other games in the series that I'd missed. So is there really something there, or was it better left as a fond memory? The hook of the series is that it's a linear racing game through famous locations. No laps, just a straightforward world tour of sorts. Or in the case of Cruisin' USA, a tour of the United States from California eastward to your destination in Washington, D.C. I think this is what appealed to me most back in the day, especially because we were in the early days of 3D graphics. It really felt like going on a road trip across the country and getting to see some well-known sites. Though, in retrospect, the representation leaves a little bit to be desired. So this is the Grand Canyon? Uh, not really. Scenery is very repetitive and scrolls past your vehicle in a distinctly choppy manner. And I have to say, there's a bit of a California bias here, don't you think? Give the East Coast and Midwest some love, too. But hey, back then, who wasn't blown away by how realistic it was to have bugs splat on your windshield while driving through Iowa in first-person view? The game has a pretty darn good sense of speed and actually controls very easily. The only levels that have much in the way of tricky maneuvering are Chicago and Washington, D.C. Now, the game does require that you get first place to advance to the next race, but this is a breeze on lower difficulty levels. It would be a stretch to say that Cruisin' USA is much of a good game, but if you have any love or tolerance left for the 3D graphics of 1996, Cruising across the U.S. is still a pretty fun and mindless way to kill about 20 or so minutes. So, my friend that I was playing Cruising Exotica with back at the MAGFest arcade room later found a cheap copy of Cruising World and gave it to me as a surprise. I'd never played Cruising World in the arcade or on the N64, and I was actually kind of immediately impressed. While I can't compare it to the arcade version, I felt like I was playing a smartly optimized port. Similar to the first game, the draw distance is not terribly far, but the coarse scenery blends well with the backgrounds, creating a colorful and appealing look. And even if the draw distance is lacking, it's a necessary sacrifice for a rock-solid 30 frames per second, which honestly feels like a bit of an accomplishment for the N64. So, all in all, it's surprisingly technically sound for a series that I had written off as being kind of bad. As you might expect, Cruisin' World takes you on a world tour that begins in Hawaii, goes through Japan, Australia, Africa, all through Europe, and then ends in Florida, where you catch a ride to the moon. Kind of cheating, don't you think? That's not exactly in the world. Cruisin' World is far less demanding than USA in terms of advancement. Only third or higher is required, but it's also more challenging on default difficulty settings. Compared to the easy breezy feel of the first game, World feels like it's trying to ground itself very slightly in reality. Very slightly. 
All I mean to say is that there is some feeling of weight to the vehicles, and that crashes and bad turns feel more punishing. This takes a bit away from the feeling of constant and easy movement, but does seem like a compromise that might have made the game appeal a bit more to racing fans. The developers also create a light trick system that adds a little bit to the gameplay. The most practical way to use tricks is to pop a wheelie by double tapping the gas, which lets you vault over other cars as you approach them from the rear, or get over oncoming traffic without any penalty. It's a pretty decent addition, but they made the tricks way more fun and easy to use in the third game, Cruisin' Exotica. I only just got this game, and to be honest, it's the reason I wanted to make a video on the series. Cruisin' Exotica turned out to be a lot harder than I expected it to be, but also a lot more fun. Just like the first game, you have to earn first place to advance, but now there are limited continues. The more miles you drive while making attempts at cruising mode, the more continues you'll have for the next time. This was a nice addition that let me get acquainted with the feel of the game without making an eventual victory too difficult to achieve, and made me spend a little more time with it than I probably would have otherwise, and I have to admit, I didn't really mind that. This is a dumb game, and it knows it's dumb, and it's all the better for it. It takes the trick system from Cruisin' World and makes it far more entertaining. Check it out! Flipping all over the place? It's hilarious! Similar to the first Cruisin' game, there's not a whole lot that slows you down. In fact, there's even less in Exotica. You're moving forward and moving forward fast. Hitting stuff, going off the road a bit, it doesn't feel like any of that makes a huge difference compared to even slightly realistic racing games. Combining this light and easy feel with popping a wheelie results in something truly magical. You can flip over your opponent's cars, or flip over oncoming traffic. And it looks kind of terrible, but it's so fun and lets you get ahead pretty easily. Not that the game is easy at all. It took some work to get through it, but it was a fun little journey. It's difficult for me to tell if all this flipping was technically all that beneficial in gaining ground and getting ahead, but it really made the game for me. If you're an N64 fan, I'd say that Cruisin' Exotica is the cruising game to get. So yeah, these are all pretty dumb games, but it's also obvious to me that they were built with some love and an understanding of the limits of the console that they were ported to. And even if each course features a pretty simple track design and repeated visuals, you get to visit a ton of places throughout the series. 41 locations across three games. Check it out! Golden Gate Park, San Francisco, US 101, the Redwood Forest, Beverly Hills, the LA Freeway, Death Valley, Arizona, the Grand Canyon, Iowa, Chicago, Indiana, Appalachia, Washington DC, Hawaii, Japan, Australia, China, Kenya, Egypt, Russia, Germany, Italy, France, England, Mexico, New York, Florida, the Moon, Korea, Atlantis, the Sahara, Hong Kong, Alaska, Las Vegas, India, Ireland, Holland, the Amazon, Tibet, and Mars. Even if the games aren't that impressive, they certainly have a ton of variety. I went into this journey with the Cruisin' series expecting it to be a terrible idea, but you know, I'm glad I did it. I had a lot more fun than I expected, and I wouldn't have bothered to waste my time making a video about it if I hadn't. I'm probably just crazy though, so I'm certainly not giving these games a wholehearted recommendation, but beneath all their layers of age and overtly dumb design, I think there's still something worthwhile here. So, the next time you run across a 90s racing game for 5 or 10 bucks that you used to enjoy, well, maybe it's aged into an irredeemable pile of garbage, but hey, if you give it a chance, maybe not. <laughs>